first, I would like to, to say in which field we are working. We are working on the territories were occupied by the German after 41. So it means a short war, maximum 41, 44, sometime 42, 43, because they entered, they left Poland, they entered in Soviet territory the 21 of June of 41, and after they tried to go until Azerbaijan. And they stopped 120 kilometers from Baku, from Azerbaijan. So if you make interview near Baku, the war stays four months, three months. But if you make interview near Poland, the war is three years. I say that because it has strong incidence about the story of Holocaust. Secondly, um, we work on territories where about, uh, under very different jurisdictions. The, by example, the west of Ukraine was connected to Poland in general government. The east of Ukraine was Reich Commissariat Ukraine. And the east east has no, always been military zone. So every zone has a different military, uh, administrative structure. That's also important for the decision of killing the Jews and also who will be exactly the killers in the different places. But before all that, I will explain you where we are now and perhaps before why a Catholic French priest uh, from Burgundy is working with a team of 25 young persons in the killing fields of Ukraine, Belarus, Russia, Poland, Moldavia. I am originally so from Burgundy and my grandfather uh, in 42 has been deported as French. They deported 25,000 French from camps, from uh, prisoner camps to punishment camps in Ukraine. And he came back alive. And when I was a child, I asked him, he, he refused to speak about this camp. The name of the village where he has been deported it was Ravaruska. It's the last place that you saw in the movie. So I asked him, what happened in Ravaruska? And he didn't want to say one word. And so finally, I, I, I was a child. I was six, seven years old. I was thinking that perhaps he did something bad. So I asked him, perhaps you killed somebody because you don't want to speak. And he said, what do you say? I'm pre I was a prisoner. He told me we had no food, no drink, but outside the camp was worse. And me as a child, I was wondering what could be worse than a camp. And it stayed somewhere in my conscience. I became a mathematic teacher and after priest. And one day I went to Poland, not at all for Holocaust, but to organize a pilgrimage for students of France to meet John Paul II in Czestokowa. And uh, we lost our road, and so it, it was a night. And suddenly I asked to somebody, but where are we? And people told me, we are, you are near Ravaroska. So unconsciously, I was exactly where my grandfather was deported. So I couldn't sleep all the night. And I realized my grandfather was deported in an extermination zone. Later and later, I learned Hebrew. I discovered the Jewish people. I was appointed as a church in charge of relation with Jews. I'm still the director of the relation for the Bishops' Conference of France with Jews. And I, I decided to study Holocaust. I didn't know Holocaust Museum of Washington. So I went to Yad Vashem. I went seven times because we organized French seminars. And uh, we learned everything. We learned the story of anti-Semitism. We learned how Hitler has been elected. We learned about the position of the church. We learned about the building of the camps, of the beginning of the gas chambers, etc., etc., etc. And uh, at the end, they, they asked me to speak in that seminar. But I said, OK, but the Holocaust didn't happen in Yad Vashem. They didn't happen in Jerusalem. I want to go back to see really what happened. Then I went back to Ravaruska. And uh, I remember I met the Burgmester, they, they call him Burgmester, the mayor, the mayor. And I asked him, what happened in your village for the Jews? I knew from the archives that in this small village, they shot 18,000 Jews. 
minimum, and also 25,000 Soviet prisoners. And today it's a small village. And the mayor told me, uh, you know, we don't know. They killed them in secret. He, I remember even one time he took his car, it's a four-wheel car, and we make a tour in the forest, and he said, you see, we don't find anything. And uh, I came back three, four times with the same question. And thanks God, the mayor lost the election. A new mayor arrived, and he told me, Patrick, I will give, make you a surprise. And he, he brought me in his car, and we left the center of Raworoska, and we entered in a small hamlet called Borove. And here were waiting with us 50 old people with their animals. And when we went out of the car, immediately we entered in the forest. And the mayor told me, Patrick, we are going to the mass grave of the last 1,500 Jews of Ravaroska. They were like you, organized like you in circle, and the mass grave was just behind. I had no camera, nothing to record. And uh, I will never forget, uh, the first one, he told me, I was with my mother keeping a cow. And suddenly I saw a German arriving alone with a motorcycle and turning and turning with a dog. And he left. And all the village, in the evening, they were speaking together, say, what are preparing the German? In fact, this guy was looking where to dig the mass grave. Now we know from the archives that in every village, there is one German. We don't know from which unit he is, who is the specialist of the digging of the mass grave. He comes before, sometime one week before, sometime two days before, sometime three days before. The mass grave don't, don't look like each other because they are killing machines. Either they are round, like a circle, and the Jews are on the top and they are killed and they fall down from the top. Either they are stairs and the Jews are to go down and lay on the corpse. It's called Sardinian Pakung, etc. In this case, in Ravaruska, they were rectangular and they were killed from the top. And this guy, normally the specialist of the mass grave, he goes to see the chief of the municipality and he asks them how many Jews in the district. You know that in Soviet Union, Jew, like Tatar, like Armenian, etc., was written in the passport. So they knew exactly where were the Jews, their name, their address, it was public. So it was very easy after for the German to go and pick up them. So this day they decided to build the Musgrave for 1,500. So the day after, three Germans arrived in Ravaroska with 30 Jews and they forced them to dig the Musgrave. The guy remembered that the Germans were, were buried during the digging. So they asked for a table from the village, they put a gramophone, and they wanted to listen German music in the forest. And one played harmonica to play music, and he, he broke his harmonica. And later, with metallic detector, we found the pieces of harmonica in the ground. And at one moment, German said to the Jews, now you are tied, you should rest. So he proposed them to go out of the grave and to sit on the grass. And at that moment, secretly, an Ukrainian policeman went down and he put explosive under the ground. After a certain time, the Germans said to the Jews, now you cannot go on digging. And of course, the 30 Jews exploded. So at that moment, another lady came and she told me, me, I was a girl in my farm. I was 14 years old. And the German came in my farm, said, come, come. And they forced her to climb in the trees and to pick up the pieces of corpse and hide them with branches at the bottom of the mass grave so that the Jews will not see the corpse. And after they brought trucks and trucks and trucks of Jews, it took one day and a half to shot 1,500 Jews only with two carabin mausers and three pushers. What does it mean pushers? It's German with gloves like that and they push the Jews if they are not dead with one bullet. Because they established a rule, one bullet, one Jew, one Jew, one bullet. It was a request of the Wehrmacht to make economy of ammunition for the war. At the end, everybody went home, so I was alone with the mayor, with Yaroslav in the forest, and Yaroslav told me, Patrick, what I did for one mass grave, 
I can do for 100 mass graves. And I will never know why he said that, and I will never know why I said yes. So I came back to Paris. I spoke to Cardinal Le Siget, who was a Jewish family, and he told me, oh, Patrick, I know the story because my Polish Jewish family has been shot in Beijing, in Poland, in the same way. After I went in New York, I met the headquarters of the World Jewish Congress. At that period was Israel Singer. And he didn't know I was speaking Hebrew. So he said to the other, you know what? We are looking for this mass grave since 44, and this guy that we don't know, he finds them. So I organized after a meeting between Lustiger and Singer in the suburb of Paris, and we decided to build Yarad in Unum. So Yarad is, it means together in Hebrew. In, Hebrew. in it means in, and Unum, it's in one. I remember Cardinal Lustiger said, we will not say Unum, because we are not one, but we are in one, and one is God. So it means together in one. So where are we now? That's the beginning of the story. But today, we are not at the same step. Today, Yarad is 25 persons working full time to find the most grave in different countries. First country, Belarus. In red is what needs to be done this year, 2012. In gray is what is already done, and that is not done. So Belarus, it's uh, like of the other countries, a post-Soviet uh, territory. There is still a Jewish community, and we don't know the number. Minimum 260,000 killed by shooting, and until 400,000, 500,000, we don't know. So it's a country where we've met no difficulty to work because the country is Soviet until now. The president has reestablished the KGB, the Kolko, the Sovko, the collective farms. And so for them, as we investigate about the crimes of, of the fascists, they are ready to say everything. It's the only country also where we could interview killers. Because the killers have been sentenced to 25 years of gulag. So now they can speak because they paid their bill. Second country, Poland. You know that in Poland, we estimate, of course, it's a country where was Auschwitz, there was Sobibor, Belzec, extermination camp Treblinka, the camps of Reinhardt operation. But one Jew per 10 has been shot. I give you an example. We were in a village, and we learned that there was a big mass grave in the village. Uh, we didn't understand why, because it was very near from Sobibor. So I asked, I interviewed a farmer. I said, did you see the death of the Jews in your village? He said, yes, because I was working in this camp. I said, but what was exactly happening? He told me it was a camp of Jews who were working in, a, in, a, in an airport as prisoners. And so we made a selection every week. We put a piece of wood like that one meter high. The Jews who could jump could survive. The Jews who couldn't jump were condemned to death. And after a few months, everybody was killed. So I said, but explain me, you are 28 kilometers from Sobibor, why you didn't bring these Jews to this camp to be killed with others? He said, the German told us it's too expensive to bring a train. So in Poland also, there is an official story with only the camps, and there is another story with the killings for any reason. And most of the time, practical reason from the point of view of the killers. It's not the easiest place to investigate because today it's a modern country, it's inside Europe, and people uh, are afraid to be accused. And also officially, uh, the killing of the Jews in Poland, it's a German story because the people who were working in the camps were German. Russia, the, the map is not well done. You know, that's uh, the, ter the occupy the territory in Russia. We are actually finishing the region of Krasnodar. You will see image. It's South Russia. And uh, they wanted to join 
oil in Baku and they could not succeed. It seems small like that because Russia is huge, but in the contrary, the distances are totally huge. That's a map of Ukraine. We were working in Ukraine since the beginning and we still have not finished Ukraine. People estimate 1 million.5 victims in Ukraine by shootings. There are mass graves everywhere. Uh, actually, there is one team who will go in Odessa in July, and uh, Robin, who is here present, uh, working in Friends of Yarad, will, will go herself in that team, in this place. And uh, uh, it's a black hole, Ukraine, because there are mass graves everywhere, in every village, nearly. As we say, when there is a forest, there are mass graves. How do we work? First, I have one person working full time in the Holocaust Museum of Washington to find the archives of this village. What does it mean? It means Soviet archives. What happened in 44, the Soviet decided to build what we call an extraordinary commission. This commission had the mission to investigate about all the crime of the fascists. So they send teams in the village. Who were these teams? It could be local authority, like the priest, the mayor, the doctor. It could be NKVD. It could be anybody, I would say, official. And it was not only about the Jews. It was about all the damage done by the Germans. What was the reason? The reason was to prepare the trial of Nuremberg, but the reason also was to get money from Germany. All these papers are million and million of pages, was written by hand most of the time, or printed, and that there is a copy in the Holocaust Museum of Washington. It's written mostly in Russian, but also in Ukrainian. So we scan that, send to Paris, I have also two persons who work in the archive of the justice of Germany. Here you have the archives of the trials. It means if somebody is accused to be among the killers, or if somebody was present at the shooting was not a killer, or if somebody was driving the car the day of the shooting, they make an interview. It's not, of course, a light interview. And that's also a million of pages. We collect that, we classify that by village, so before we go to the village, we have the Soviet version and the German version. The German version gives a lot of details about the way of killing. But they never give indication, uh, rarely, about the place. You don't know, sometimes you know the name of the village, but you will have very rarely the description where it was in the village. Opposite for the Soviet, it has been done after, so you have a lot of things about the place of the killing and about the situation of the village and very few things about the killers. So with these two versions, we arrive in the village. Here it's a village in north, north Ukraine, northwest Ukraine, Serniki. So we knew that there, in this village were shooting. You see it's freezing. You must understand the roads are not good, and also there is no, no, running, no running water in the, in the house. Everybody is taking water outside. Svetlana is working for Yarad since 10 years, because we have a team in France, but we have also people who work with us in Ukraine or Russia, always the same. She has surely interviewed more than 1,000 persons herself. And she stops a guy who is with his, uh, uh, you see, with his horse, and she asked him always the same question. Two questions. Were you here during the war? And were you present at the execution? And this one, he said, yes, uh, I was present. I will speak to you later. But in the farm, just in front, there is a certain Maria who, who knows a lot of things. So we let him go, and we enter in a farm. Where is Maria? Here is Maria. Maria was a, a teenager, and uh, uh, she saw the arrestation of the Jews, how they built a colon, and how these Jews were driven to the mass grave. But suddenly, when she said mass grave, the husband said, I remember the size of the mass grave because I was a digger. 
And so we didn't know what to do because it was two stories. And as I say, the worst case is when you interview a couple, they always disagree. <laughs> so whatever she said, he said it was not true. So uh, it's why they, they, uh, they have this smiling face. And um, so nevertheless, through her, we learned a lot about the arrestation. And through him, we learned a lot about the digging. So he said that a few days before the shooting, somebody came to tell him to dig the grave. So they told him to take his spade. There were 30 diggers. And we asked, how was the mass grave? He said it was a very special mass grave, like a rectangular. And on two sides, stairs. And like a small alley in the middle. We have never seen such a case, so we asked him many details. And he said, why we did that? Because the Germans say we have no time. Because the partisan, the Soviet partisan, are in the forest. And they can attack us at any moment. So they must be killed in a rush. So we asked the Jews to go down in the mass grave by both sides. The people who are arriving from this side have to lay on this side and the other on the other side. If the heads were in the middle, one German was walking in the middle with a machine gun. If the heads were on the other side, he walks on the top of the mass grave with another machine gun. He remembers also that the Germans said, we have no time to bury them. You must first pick up the belongings and bring them back to school. So there were 10 horses and carts behind the forest. And just when the Jews undressed, they brought back the suits to the school because in the suits, there is the money. And the Germans want the money. And after, they will sell the clothes by auction in the village. You must understand it's the first time they speak. He never spoke before. It's not professional witnesses. They, the, at the end of the interview, we, we always ask, did you speak since 42? Hey, no, no, first time. So after, we asked him if he accepted to go back to the mass grave. Most of the time, these people, they cannot walk a lot, but they dream to go back there because they never forget the place. So you, we see our van is there. He has already crossed this way. That was the path of the death for the Jews. You must understand, I will explain you after how it works. When they surrender the Jews in the morning, they tell them they will be deported to Palestine, or to Kiev, or to good countries. And so they have to take the maximum of belongings because they will need to travel. It's why they have all their money, all their jewels, all what they can carry in the pockets or in small bags. Because for the German after, it's very easy to take back that from the clothes. Because otherwise, they are afraid that the local Ukrainian or Russian will attack the house and steal everything. So in fact, unconsciously, the Jews bring the goods to the mass grave, thinking they go to Palestine. So he goes to the mass grave. That's the road. You see, when you bring more than 1,000 people on this road, how you can imagine you will be killed? There is no special reason. There is no indication. That's a typical road of the country in winter. We try to make a drawing because it was strange. So we try to make a drawing to ask him, where did the Jews went? So he said, there are stairs here, stairs there, and the corpses are there. And we found a star, a Magan David. You know that the Jewish girls, before being shot, they don't want to give their jewels to the German. So they throw them anywhere. And sometimes we find them with metallic detector. That's important at two levels. It's important, I would say, at a human level, because it's the last jest that this girl did in 42 or 33. And so it's, we can say, finally, we found you. But there is also another reason. It's an evidence that the victims are Jews. Because people can say, but perhaps they were communists, but perhaps they were partisan, but perhaps they were not even killed by German, but by Soviet, etc. So you have killing by killing to find the evidences. Here, 
I will change completely. I will give you only three examples. And after we have, have an, an exchange, because I know it's complicated to understand, we work on that since 10 years. And I think we understand half. So here we are in a farm. We are in South Russia. It means Krasnodar. So uh, if you, I'm sure that many people don't know where is Krasnodar. I didn't know myself. It's near Sochi, where will be the Olympic Games. But it's easier to, to realize. But we are not in the center of Sochi, where it's a nice city, and not in the center of Krasnodar. So we arrive in this farm. First, it was a little bit surprising. It was not in the village. It was a small hamlet, isolated. In this part of occupied territory, we have no archive, nearly, because it was the end of the war. The German arrived in November 42 and left in March 43 maximum. They only killed Jews, gypsies, and communists. It was the only task. And they did very few reports to Berlin because they were not sure to win the war. So they were not sure what will be what happened to that report. So that's also a problem for, for Holocaust. If you study Holocaust in France, you will have an amount of evidences. If you study Holocaust in Caucasus, in Russia, you will have no, no evidence in the archives, because no report. The only report that we have are Soviet reports. And you know that we can always accuse Soviet to make propaganda, because they did a lot of propaganda. So we arrive in this farm because people told us, the man in this farm, he knows everything. We arrive, they were occupied. She, were, she actually is repairing the house. I tell you that it's one month ago, that this picture, all these pictures you will see are only from one month ago. I asked them, we received them from France two days ago. So she prepares like bricks in a traditional way with corn and mud. And here is the allure of the farm, you know. I say, I, I show that voluntary to show you in which area Holocaust took place in this part of the world. We are very far. It's why the German never imagined we could come back to find evidences, because it's in the middle of nowhere. It's far from everywhere. Who were the Jews here? There were no Jews from Russia. Why? Because they received radio emission from Moscow regularly, telling them the Germans are killing the Jews, the gypsies, and the communists. So the Russian, the Russian Jews from this part of territory made what we call in Russia evacuatia. It means they went far east, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and sometimes even Siberia, by themselves or by train. So why there are Jews? Because all the Jews were escaped. Because a lot of Jews from Germany, from Poland, from Ukraine, tried also to escape. And they arrived in this part of Soviet Union. And the Soviet system did not let them go further. They gave them, say, I put 200 Jews in this village, 300 Jews in this village, etc., etc. And the gypsies, they, they didn't. They were outside of everything. They didn't know even the killers were coming. So in this village, there were 300 Jews. But these Jews were mainly Polish Jews or German Jews, we think. We are not sure. But the witness. I will tell you a very special story. It's a difficult story, one of the most difficult. The big problem to investigate Holocaust with the facts is to bear it. Because it's a crime. And it's not one crime, it's millions of crimes. Every victim saw the shooter, every shooter saw the victim. So he was a child. He was a child of, I remember, I think 12 years old when the German arrived. First, he remembers that many Jews arrived as refugees. He says these Jews were not Soviet, they didn't know to cultivate. We welcomed them in the farms, but they didn't work, and they paid their food with the money they brought from their country. And suddenly, he saw a German arriving alone in the village, with no gun, nothing. He had only a small book note. 
And he told him, do you know where are the Jews in your village? And him, he was a child. He said, yeah, yes, I know where are the Jews. They are in these farms. So the Germans say, would you accept to come with me in my court with horse to help me because we are taking the Jews far away to, make the, to resettle them? And he told me, it was strange because I saw 17 carts with horses from the Kolkos, but nobody wanted to speak to me. So he went with the German in every house, and the German had the list of the Jews. Because in that region, the German didn't destroy the Soviet system. They kept it. So they have all the record where the Soviet put the Jews. So house by house, he was checking that every Jew was here. And you know what he said? Because he arrived in the morning, he told him, the German told him, you know, now I am tied. I would like to make a knot. Please, if you could establish a kind of bag outside, I will sleep and say to the Jews, we leave at 5 p.m. So this boy, he ran to the houses and said, you must be ready to f at 5 p.m. And at 5 p.m., but him, as he helped the German, he said, you promised me I want to make a tour with your horse. So this guy, he wake up the German at 4, and he said, you promised me to make a tour. So the German said, OK, so all the Jews go on the cart. And he said to him, yes, we make a tour climb with the, Jew, with the Jews in the cart. And he was happy. And he said that in every cart nearly, where teenagers from the village were playing to have a free tour with cart and horse. And suddenly, the German began to be very violent. And he said, I don't want any more child of the village on the carts. But he wanted to stay. So they take something to make them go away. And he said, that was it for me. I, I, I went on playing with my friends near the river. And he said, suddenly we heard many people yelling and shooting. And before I, I didn't tell you, in his house, was, he was becoming friend with a young Jew called Itzrik. Same age. They played together during all the time he was a refugee. And he didn't know what happened. He went back to sleep in his house, this one. The day after, he went back to the river where he heard the shootings. And suddenly, he saw a corp of a Jew was floating. So he said, I've never seen a dead person and never see a dead. I, I didn't realize. So he took a piece of wood to see the face. And it was the face of Itzrik. And so after he said that suddenly arrived more than 100 corps on the river. So he realized that the German did a trick. And they, sh they, were, they had shot all the Jews in the river. He came back in his family. He said, I was like crazy. I arrived in my farm. And I was turning, turning, turning like that, like crazy. He said, I was losing my brain. So the father said, what happens to you? Why, why are you running like that? And he said, oh, I saw, I saw we have killed all the Jews. So the father closed his mouth with the hand, brought him back to the house, and said, I forbid you to go out of the, of the farm during three days. You must say that to nobody. Otherwise, we'll be killed. So imagine a witness who saw everything in the middle. and. Today, who lives in the middle of nowhere. It's the first time that he speaks, and it was one month ago. So it's why, for Yarad, we are in front, confronted to a strange challenge. It's the first time they speak. They speak because they are old, and because the Soviet Union is destroyed. But they are old, so it's the end of their life. It's why we are trying to accelerate. We make 15 investigations per year. Every investigation is 17 days. I will go myself next Saturday. I will be in Romania. During all the testimony, his wife went on working, preparing this kind of reparation of the houses. It's to show you where we are. Because when people think Holocaust, they think Berlin, they think Hitler, they think Munich, they think Auschwitz. And it's true. But 
all this part of the territory where they killed more than two million people, nobody knew anything because it was far from everywhere. They even built a system so that the chicken could sleep in the trees. Last story. Let's come back in Ukraine. It's a small village. It was a Russian region. People don't know that in Soviet Union, before Soviet Union, in the time of the Tsar, they asked minority to come, German minority, Tatar minority, Jewish minority, and they gave them a piece of land to cultivate. In this region, it was a Jewish region. When the Soviet arrived, when Stalin arrived, he organized that in Kolkos, of course, so it was an administration, a Jewish administration. And it was connected to the American Jews through the joint. It, me it means they received money from the joint, and they had very modern, by example, the first electric tractors from America have been used in that region. Same thing, we are east of Ukraine, so most of the Jews, they heard that the Germans are killing the Jews, so they tried to evacuate by boat. But the boats were too small, so they couldn't take the old people, and they couldn't take the half Jews, because there were many weddings between Jews and non-Jews. They called them the Mischling. A few months after the arriving of the Jews, arrived the decision to kill the half Jew. So they sent policemen in the school with cart and horse. They enter in the school during the teaching and they choose one, you, 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 and they take all the young half Jews from this school. The children were from zero to six. It was like a kindergarten. All these carts brought the children to a place where they shot all these children. They shot 1,100 children, zero to six. People know very few about the killing of this category of half Jews because they followed exactly the same rule that in Auschwitz or in Western Europe. That's the school. You know, typical Soviet school, I know it's very far from Georgetown University, but uh, it's already not bad. And uh, this school has stopped to work only since two years. It was still working, and you see it's an official Soviet monument of the victory for the Great War. Of course, no memorial of the Jews. We were, wo I will make you think about this guy. This guy saw everything. He was seven years old the day of the shooting. First, he saw the arrestation of the, of the half Jews in the school. And his grandmother was very upset. She began to yell against the German. But people told her, if you go on like that, they will kill you. And him, he followed the cart and the horse in the field of corn. And he stayed behind to see the shooting. So we told him, do you accept to come back near the mass grave? He said yes. And he told me, I was watching the shooting from the place where they are growing the corn. I said, ah, yes, where is it? He told me, it's there. I said, but it's very far from the mass grave. I said, oh, no, I didn't tell you. In fact, we approached. I was not alone. I was with other children. So that's also a question for us. In Soviet Union, Holocaust was not secret. It was public. Everybody came to see, everybody came to watch. It was like a show. It's why we can find so many witnesses until today, because the first witnesses were the children. Were buried, so it was like a spectacle. They tried also to catch something, to catch shoes, or a jacket, or a piece of gold. So the killing was surrounded by teenagers. So he saw everything. So he told me the carts arrived one by one. The policemen took the children from the cart, zero to six. They put them near the mass grave, and the Germans were shooting. So I told him, but 
uh, the children were not afraid when they saw all these corpses, so they couldn't see them because they put them one meter from the, bottom, from the line of the mass grave, so they couldn't see inside. And um, suddenly I realized that he was seven years old. So I said, perhaps you knew children among these children were killed. He said, oh yes, they were two of my cousins, Boris and David. And I said, but uh, uh, the children were not moving, not to be shot, not running. He told me, no, yeah, no they didn't do that because they were missing uh, bullets. So for all the babies, they crashed the head of the babies against the cart. So the other children were so afraid to be killed like that, but they didn't move. So I told him, how many babies you, say the, you saw the head crash on the car? He told me more than 200. And it stayed a full day. So for me, that's a question always I raise about humanity. Because when you work about a genocide village by village, you have a lot of anthropology questions. How is it? This child was not special. Don't know if the family was anti-Semite or not, but I think it was not the, the main question. How is it that a child who is seven years old will stay with a group of friends to watch the shooting of more than 1,000 children the same age and come back home? And today is not, not more psychotic than you and me. So that's a human question because that's, unfortunately, that's, that's what makes a genocide easy. It's when you, you can see a genocide. If you are unsure, it's not for you. If you are sure that you are not Jew, you are not gypsy, you are not communist, you are not gay, so there is very few danger, so you can approach. So for me, it's a human qu question because it seems that in the bottom of humanity, there is a capacity to bear a genocide, even to be the neighbor. Before, before I began my job, I was thinking that the people who were living around Auschwitz, around Belzec, around Sobibor, around the Mosgrave, would be strange people with awful faces. And, but when I opened the door, I never know if this family killed Jews or saved Jews. They are the same face. So, so the first thing. The second thing is that the fact that the genocide are public, it gives hope for us. Because it means there is no genocide without witnesses. So it means that any genocide can be scrutinized by the local people who saw everything. If the genocide of Jews, the gypsy is the same. If it's the genocide in Rwanda or Darfur, etc., it's the same. So we are, Yarad now is beginning to connect with other organizations who are working on, on other genocide with the same hypothesis. A genocide is public. The killers say it's secret, but it's secret in public. And people don't speak because they saw it. And they are afraid to be accused to have been part of it. So all the strategy of Yarad is always to raise positive question and to go around the guilt. I will give you a last example. I was in a family and uh, it was in a small village and the family told me, don't lose your time father in our farm, go in the farm in front. Because in this farm, they were hosting Jews in the night, and every morning, the Jews were dead. So it means what it means. So I, I closed my camera, I crossed the small street, and I, the woman, when she saw me, she was on a little bench, and she said, Father, I know why you come, because my neighbor told you that the Jews were dead in our farm. And I said, but it was true? She told me, yes. And uh, so I was thinking how to drive the interview. Because if I say, did your family kill them, it's the end of the interview. So I said, but uh, many people died in your farm like that? She told me, oh, many, yes. And she told me, surely they committed suicide. And I said, even the babies? And she told me, yes. So I was thinking how to go on. So I said, oh, ma'am, it must have been embarrassing for you, all these dead corpses in the morning. So she told me, well, I will show you. And she puts her boots, her jacket, and she told me, I carried the corpse myself. 
and we found 18 small mass graves at the end of the village. So you must understand that Holocaust in Soviet Union by the German, it was the killing units, Einsatzgruppen. It was any German who could participate, even civil German, even women of killers. I, uh, we have the, the, te the testimony of one shooter, his child is coming to watch. The child, the child is 13 years old. He asked to the father, can you give me the carabine? I want, would like to kill one. And he killed one. So it could be any German. It could be any local people who are collaborating with the German. Because it was legal to kill Jews, gypsies, and communists. It was legal. We found recently an archive. It's a text from a judge, an SS judge, from, who is working in Ukraine. He writes to another SS judge, and he said, what to do when people kill Jews without authorization? Imagine the question. The other SS judge tell you, I, I said, I cannot answer you. I have to ask Himmler. It took time, and we got the answer. The answer said there are two cases. Either it was for racial reason, for racist reason, it was legal. You have no, nothing to do. Either they kill the Jews to rape the girl or to take the house. Here, you have to punish them, but don't be too tough. So they opened the door, but it was legal to kill Jews. So it seems when you open the legality to kill a part of the population, it seems that everybody can be a victim, everybody can be a killer. People were totally transformed. Because we can say, OK, in Ukraine, some regions are anti-Semite, OK. But now we are in Caucasus far away, and it's the same thing. And we were in Belarus, and it's the same thing. And we're in Poland, and it's the same thing. So it raised, I think, more human question than national question. To finish, we are, I am finishing a second book. And we try to rebuild, step by step, the shooting from the morning to the night. Because the German arrive in the morning, announce deportation in Palestine, and leave in the night. And I will finish by that, because we are still investigating. I saw a text of a survivor, and she said, in fact, the German and all this caravan of oars and carts to bring our belongings, they, they came one night before, and they slept near the ghetto. I felt it strange. Because we interviewed 2,800 persons, and nobody told us that it was required to be near the ghetto all the night before. They all say they arrive in morning, and they let in night. So I began to investigate to say why nobody says they are here all the night. <laughs> the girl, she, she used the term a bivouac. She said it was like camping near our ghetto. And she said we understood, all the Jews understood would be killed when we saw that during the night. And suddenly, I found a survivor from Minsk. And him, he was 14 years old in the ghetto of Minsk, and he said, we had never one night quiet, because every night they enter in the ghetto to rape the Jewish girl. And he described two rapes that he saw from his room. And when the family didn't want, they killed all the family. So there is another part of the story that is not known, but we are trying to work on it. It's all the Holocaust for the Jewish girls, because it's a story who is not written. Thank you. Any question is possible. Yes? What is the cause? I, you need a microphone, otherwise it will not be recorded. I have, I have been told. What is the cause of anti-Semitism?